Okay, so um, welcome, Lee. This is Lee Halsell. Uh, she works for Centric Consulting. I actually met Lee. If you've been on a few of these, you've heard me say that, well, I met this last, uh, our, our today's uh, speaker at in a Columbus conference. That's how I met Lee as well. Uh, it's up there for, I think it was the retailing conference that Dave Cherry yeah. was actually running and he introduced me to Lee. And one of the things that I think, uh, well, one, we, I think are very similar in personalities, but another reason that I was really drawn to Lee too is her invested interest in, in data and analytics and the role that they play. Lee would tell you that she is not a trained analyst, uh, but she understands the importance of data and the use of that and how analytics is sort of transforming every field. And actually that's a lot of what our conversation was about of how important it is to be understand the and have the data literacy and quantitative literacy to be ready for the future. So I am going to turn it over to Lee to talk to us about how she and Centric Consulting think through um, driving customer value through data informed innovation. So thank you, Lee. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. May I go ahead and share my screen? Absolutely. All right, this could, who knows what this is going to uh, yield to, all right. We can see it, looks good. All right, so thank you for that nice introduction. I, I'm delighted to know um, Sandy and all the group at CADS and um, my son works at CADS. So I have developed a relationship and, and follow all the work. Uh, so I uh, wanted to speak last year, but school shut down. So unfortunately didn't have that opportunity, but was um, engaged for this opportunity. So we're gonna talk about driving customer value through data-informed innovation. And, and really, uh, you know, that's a lot going on. It's really about the keywords are value, um, you know, using data, and we're gonna talk a lot about that, but also innovation and thinking about innovation, how companies are using data, um, innovation in this um, kind of new dispersed world, kind of remote innovation, um, and that's where data has become even more key. So with that, um, as an agenda, I've uh, got a couple slides here, but certainly if you have questions or, you know, I'd love your feedback and thinking about, you know, what you've learned in your classes or what you've read about. Uh, I want this to be interactive. Don't feel like you have to um, just listen to, to me go on. So please, by all means, um, jump in and, and let's talk about things. Normally, I when I'm talking to a, a class, we're in a classroom and it's easy to see people and get engagement. It's a little bit different on screen. So welcome, welcome your uh, questions and thoughts. Give a brief introduction about me in a minute. Um, we'll talk a little bit about machine learning, a, a refresher on that. You know, we've got a wide variety of majors and, and interests that attend. Uh, innovation overview. Um, some different approaches to innovation and uh, examples uh, from work that Centric has done, linking that to our approach, uh, innovation delivery, and then looking ahead to 2025. Again, we can have questions at the end or certainly by ask questions as we go along. So I love this quote, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. So what is innovation? What is looking at data? It's looking at new ways of things. So, um, you know, speaking about old, um, you know, bust, but first about me, I've already got a typo. Um, first about me, um, as you can see, I've had a lot of different um, roles within uh, my career over 30 years. I graduated from Miami University with a degree in finance. Um, as Sandy mentioned, I really loved the idea and I started working in college using data um, I worked in retail and sales, and I loved being able to track data and see what that means, what changes I can implement, and then what was the value of that. And so from test and learn, reading data, looking at implementation, implementing different strategies. Um, so throughout my career, I've spent a lot of time in retail um, and a lot of time in business development, a lot of times looking at opportunities to sell, grow ideas, innovate, um, again, always coming back to the root of data and seeing what is working, what is not working. Um, I got into specifically data science um, a couple roles ago at a company called G2O here in Columbus, worked with a data science team and really built out um, how to use data and how to improve the value um, uh, of companies, pain, problems, 
things that they were trying to solve um, by implementing data science and data over looking at ways, uh, different ways with their data. Um, and as Sandy mentioned, I currently work for Centric Consulting. I'm in an account manager business development role. Centric is uh, based here in Ohio, uh, Dayton. Um, we founded about 21 years ago and have a thousand employees worldwide. Uh, work with companies all over uh, the globe uh, to management consulting. We do data and analytics, software development, um, people, process, uh, improvement, and change. Um, the other thing I want to note uh, as well, I have a wide variety of interests. Um, I'm on the board of a startup. Um, I have my own consulting company. I'm on the board at Ohio State. I volunteer, I lecture, I mentor, take in additional classes. So, you know, as you think about your kind of career and where you're going, I think it's really important not only to think about your job, but also in your career, but also what, what are you doing outside of work and making sure that you stay well-rounded um, and, and follow interests. I've had the luxury of being able to meet with a lot of different people, do lots of different activities, give back to the community. Um, and I think that is just as important um, in your life as the roles that you have within your career. As noted earlier, um, I'm a mom to two sons. One is graduating from Miami and works at CADS. And then I have a son who's still in high school and I've been married for 25 years and I am not a merger. I know that's big at Miami. So kicking things off, just want to really talk about, um, you know, every organization has an advantage. And one of the biggest competitive advantages that companies have is their data, because their data is different than the next person. And how you leverage that data and thinking about how you innovate within your industry, your company is really important. And how you take advantage of that and be constantly thinking of using that as your advantage to grow market share, grow your revenue, reduce costs um, are really important throughout every organization and, and every industry. So a lot going on on this slide, um, but just kind of bifurcating between machine learning and artificial intelligence and a lot of times we kind of use those words a bit interchangeably, but thinking about machine learning, you know, really about how you kind of use data. Um, I love that it says, um, you know, this is really where you kind of build models and you have a result. So you think about, I want to optimize or improve. Um, you want to detect something um, where art, and that is really using um, data that continually um, improves the model. Right, and that's where the learning comes from. From an artificial intelligence is really more of task that's taking kind of the people out of it. So you think about Alexa, um, you think about bots that may be running. A lot of organizations are really trying to think about how to automate tasks. A lot of things that, um, especially now that people work outside of the office, trying to think about how to take away um, mundane tasks so people can really focus on value added tasks. So how do you streamline that and really think of within processes that something behind the scenes can be running things that are repeatable, you do all the time, you know, can that be done um, with different tools and automation tools. So just a brief um, overview as we think about data and just kind of bigger uh, components within So a little bit deeper dive around machine learning. Um, love these examples of uh, really thinking about complex interdependencies, um, how you take large data sets, things that humans couldn't comprehend, things that Excel may struggle with, but being able to see, take all that data and there's good data and bad data, but really taking all the data at its lowest level and being able to um, you know, see different things that you've never seen before. Um, another one is how to optimize. Um, so a lot of people can think about, oh, there's very easy to improve this or cut this, or here's where it really is. Here's the top five things. Um, but really, you can also see things and you're really almost um, as a scientist, um, creating hypothesis 
and then can tell you different factors. So I love this about employee retention. You know, it's very easy to say why people stay or when maybe why people go, but there's probably other factors within the data that you can start to see patterns and, and correlate to different, um, to different answers and be able to address those. Um, then there's a, the final one is about um, weather. We always know that there's always a chance of rain, um, but there's a lot of random, randomness and there's a lot of um, things that outside of the data that happen. And so data science and, and modeling have to take that into account um, in terms of the efficacy of the model. But machine learning, um, part of it is it continues to improve and learn from some of those, the additional data and the randomness. So as you think about identifying opportunities, these percentages do not equal 100. So um, do want to call that out if someone says, um, hey, there's a lot of 30%. Uh, but I, what I liked about this is just kind of looking at different um, areas that machine learning in terms of um, customer insights, reducing costs, a lot of customer experience, um, areas that you can use machine learning. And, and there's certainly smaller smaller areas as well, but this just kind of, kind of gives an overview of how organizations um, currently use machine learning. And then overall, I think it's important to know from, if you're a data scientist, data analyst, someone who's using large data sets, there's really three kind of interesting factors or interesting kind of um, areas that you really need to think of beyond, do I have the technical skills? That's kind of the obvious one. Uh, but those are always changing and those are things you can learn. But there's two things that are also really important in terms of patience. It takes a lot of time to pull together data and code. Um, on data science projects in the past, it can take 60% of the time of just pulling together all the data and the data munging. And a lot of times code doesn't work the first time or the second time. You spend a lot of time, and but it's really important to take that time and be able to get the um, data in a way that you can really glean the insights. And then also having curiosity, you know, what is the truth? And what did people, um, you're not trying to look for an answer, you're not trying to validate, but really come up with, here's what the data shows. So this is really important to not kind of take out the bias or not kind of leading the witness, if you will, but what does the data really show us when we're looking at it at the end of the day? As we look at what innovation and how that time ties into data, uh, companies are always trying to innovate and they've got to look at where we are today and getting through the work and um, the day to day, but also saying where, as the phrase goes, where is the puck going? Where should, what new things should we be doing in terms of um, you know, strategy, um, competitive advantage, um, and spending time to be able to do that. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to create processes and how to really have um, an innovative mindset. So three things that innovation really involve are incubation of ideas, validating those ideas, and then being able to take them to market and understand what the value is and testing them. Um, so creating a framework that allows this these process to come to light is super important. So I love the, um, and I'm sure you've come through this in, in different classes, um, kind of the case studies around, were they category killers or were they category creators? So as we think about Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Uber, Facebook. Uh, they really started in one area. I mean, Amazon was a person putting books in boxes out of his garage. Now think of how pervasive and all the categories that really Amazon touch. Netflix used to send you DVDs. Now they create content. They really use data to understand what people were watching and create content out of that. Apple had desktop computers. Now think of how your phone and music and all the applications, um, watches, all of that. These are all technology companies, but really disrupted categories like retail and the entertainment industry and technology. 
I mean, even Uber, um, they were, it was a ride sharing application. You know, now you can get food delivered. There's different ways you can travel. They're really branching out and using data, really being innovative, looking at the data and thinking where are other areas that we can capture business? We all know Facebook. So Facebook started uh, by some students at Harvard and had literally two pictures up and you could look at the two pictures and, and rate them, I think, as, as we've seen in the movie. Now it, it's changing how we communicate, how we consume news, all of those um, different facets that Facebook really touches. Again, how did they get to um, be one of the largest advertisers? Um, and that's where they make a lot of money. They looked at the data. So as we think about innovation and how those companies did it, um, being able to facilitate ideas and being able to incubate them, uh, Facebook, um, Netflix, Amazon, you know, they're constantly running beta tests of new ideas, being able to go out um, and, and look at what could work um, for them and what are their customers interested in. They need to validate their ideas. So they need to go out, they need to test it. Um, there's different prototypes. They could be doing A-B testing and really looking at the data and understanding uh, what's working, what may not be working, what's a tweak, what is something maybe that they just have to walk away from. And ultimately, we need to figure out how do we scale that? So as we're moving along and incubating, we, we get something that works. Well, now we have to roll it out within our, um, within our whole kind of customer base. Think about how Amazon had to go again from one garage all the way to you know, a global system um, a network of distribution centers. Um, they have their own planes and, and shipping um, beyond all the other activities that they really, in terms of even distributing content, right, on, on Prime. Innovation really requires a different mindset and thinking about breaking some habits, again, of just um, Here's where we are today and thinking about what else is out there and really being curious again, thinking about um, going back to qualities of looking at the data, being curious about what is out there. And sometimes it's what the data says and sometimes it's what the data doesn't say. I spent a lot of years in retail and we were able to see um, conversion rates. So if a customer walks into a store, there's a 30% chance that they're buying something. Well, that also means there's a 70% chance that they're not. Why did they walk in and leave? Helping to understand that. And that's more difficult because if they didn't transact, how do I know it was, I didn't have a color, I didn't have a size, I didn't, what was it that made them leave? Maybe the line was too long. Maybe they couldn't get in a fitting room. Um, whatever it was, sometimes in the data you can't see that but it's just as important to understand and maybe dig in a little bit more for the data you have. But also, it may be, and we'll talk about this in a minute, augmenting with outside data to help get a better kind of overall view of what may be happening. That's a change of mindset. It's much easier to just say, oh, I'm selling this. This is working. I want to do more of this. That doesn't mean you're missing some other things. An innovative approach, when we think about a process, there's three kind of big areas. We want to have speed to value. How do we bring ideas um, quickly to the marketplace to be able to understand their viability? We want a repeatable way that we can do that so we know and kind of minimize maybe some of the noise and outside variables. Because if we had success one way and then do a, do a rollout or a test um, a totally different way. It may or may not work, and it may be a function of how we tested and how we rolled out, not a function of the viability of that idea. And then certainly understanding um, getting the data from these new tests. It's going to generate um, some new data, and how do you integrate that with the data that you have and the business model that you have, but also look at it independent to be able to read and understand it and get value from it, from these new activities. I don't know if we wanna pause 
I've been talking a lot. Any questions at this point from anything that I've covered? Any feedback? What are what are what are you thinking about at this point? My son said not to call on anyone, so I'm not going to call on anyone. But any anyone um, anyone? I can't see if there's someone raising their hand, so please just speak up. I would throw in a question, and I think you said you might be getting to this. But given where some people might be sitting in their career paths and where they're headed to, you were talking about uh, when you were working for some retail, I don't know if you were at Express at the time, but like, why do people, you know, someone comes into the store and doesn't buy anything. So there's a 70% chance they're not going to shop, right? 30% great that we got somebody, but did you, are you going to talk a bit about how you might measure what the drivers of that lost transaction were? or how you might get that information, or if you weren't able to, because let's be honest, right? Things have changed over the years as well. Maybe you couldn't get that data before, but today you might be able to get that data. How might students think about the augmentation of the data that they have? Sure, um, I touch on it later on. I don't I don't have a, that specific use case, but um, okay. with the growth of online, being able to capture people's clicks, where they go, where they spend their time. I mean, eye movement, um, where they go after cookies. There's a lot of dialogue and, and conversation around um, the efficacy of that and trailing people for ads, right? And, and people wanna control their own data. But it also is critical to that company to see where you're going through the organization. So whether it be a retailer, whether it be building a home, if you're on a home builder's website, a furniture retailer, looking to apply for a credit card, where do people fall off? Where do they actually go and the clicks? What's their intent? So there's the data that says this is where they went through and this is the quantity of times, but also what was the intent? You know, so there is something similar to marketing of what was the value of it. Um, you have to you have to read into it and, and spend time looking at all the data collectively. Um, I worked on a project with a large retailer, and they had rolled out a new um, incentive program for their sales associates. And they said, "Hey, we've increased our payouts thirteen percent." of money that we pay to associates, but we only saw a lift in sales of 5%. They wanted to know why. There was a, we're paying more money than we're actually getting back in. And we want to incent people to sell and get higher revenue. And so it was really interesting to understand um, the characteristics of the associate, the characteristics in terms of time and role, the characteristics of what the market basket, what were they selling? Um, what was the um, interaction of the items? We could look at dwell time. Um, you could see when customers um, came in. You could see lots of how much money that they spent. So all of those factors could impact as well as what was the size of the store? What was the revenue of the store in terms of square footage to dollars? All of those pieces. So there was a lot of just information um, and bringing it all, all to the forefront. Um, and again, connecting, there was somewhat of connecting the dots. I mean, we, we had a, almost a 50 page deck of looking at the details. We had to take outliers out. Um, to your point, Sandy, bringing in and augmenting some outside data um, around the markets for those certain areas, but really, you know, looking at all of the different facets and we could really say, here's how, like an interesting, where a person starts out in their first 30 days and then tracking them six months later, it was interesting to say, if you were a high performer to start, you're just only gonna get better. For folks who had a very slow ramp up in terms of uh, their capabilities of selling, they never got to the level of other people. So even with the best training and, the, and folks around them, some people just sell better and they hit the ground running and they sell. Um, there was characteristics about how, what they were selling also made a difference in terms of their almost core item of what the customer was coming in to buy. So they might have bought other things, but you could tell that the, the reason that the person came into a store was one of their big kind of key items. Um, when that was, the value of the sale and the performance of that associate did much better. Um, your question about how do you track 
and understand. Think of a drive through of a restaurant. Most of it's cash, right? You're coming through, you're ordering, you take your order and you go, how do I really know who my customer is? It's very difficult, but again, understanding behaviors, understanding time, um, there's a lot of other factors that you can pull out of the data um, to make good decisions, but you really, it, it, it can be difficult at times to fill the gap unless you're buying data sets um, uh, and, and, or if you can, it's hard to identify if a customer, usually you don't self-identify, if I don't transact with you, you have no reason to know who I am. Um, but we know that you came into the store and walked out of the store. Again, how do we get to the point of, are we having it at time? Maybe we don't have enough staff on the floor. We seem to have a lower conversion rate over the lunch hour or over dinner hour or on a Saturday. Maybe we just don't have enough staff on the floor. You know, understanding again, what are the commonalities that are happening and, and really drilling down um, and being able to be curious about it, having some hypothesis, and maybe you start to test and learn. And then again, looking across, are you having that same problem other places? Um, what are the differentiators, especially if you've got a large, um, say for stores, lots of different stores, being able to see is there commonalities or outliers that may be different in their conversion rate, they're higher or lower than the average, you know, the difficult thing is always trying to take away and not average, getting to the lowest denominator of data so you can um, really drill down into um, the detail. Yeah, I was, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking, oh yeah, we could, you could just test a few things and see if stuff, if that does drive. But again, it's, it's gonna, it's hit or miss, right? <clears throat> yep. We'll keep going into the innovation, um, thinking about the core principles. Um, if we talk about um, you know, innovation just doesn't happen. We have to think about a process and think about how we roll out and test ideas. So there's three key areas about, you know, is it a desirable item for our customer? Um, is it feasible for our business? And what's the overall viability and value to us for this innovation? So I'm gonna go through each of these and then give you, show you a case study or an example of, of how that works. So desirability. Um, so come up with ideas and really thinking about, um, is this something in the marketplace that is going to you know, give us incremental value, sales, reviews, I like strengthening relationships. There's lots of different metrics beyond just kind of sales and profit. There can be other ways that you're rolling out uh, innovative ideas to build and grow your business. There was a, a company here in Columbus um, that was an online ticket retailer. And as you know, many industries, um, hotel, aviation, uh, people don't show up buy a ticket or they you know, are going to um, commit to something and then they don't come. Well, that's lost revenue. And you may know that a lot of those industries oversell room seats with the anticipation of, because of the data and they've modeled it, hey, we're gonna have so many no-shows, so it's okay. Now, obviously that doesn't happen. Planes can be oversold. Everyone actually shows up and we've got 110 people and 105 seats and that's addressed. But for this, the ticket retailer had um, empty seats at an event and it was lost revenue. Um, and also they knew that there were people who wanted those seats. Um, so we were able to build a model and look at certain predictive power of um, events and behaviors to be able to predict when attendance might be different than um, the no-shows, if you will, and then really increase profits through the resale opportunity of tickets. So um, this was you know, something in terms of, is this uh, desired by the marketplace? Yeah, because you've got people who wanna go to an event and you know there's people who are not going to come. So how do you, um, a little bit like Uber, right? I've got an empty car and I've got someone that needs to go somewhere. How do you link up those two? So we were able to help this retailer with a predictive model uh, to fill those empty seats. We think about feasibility. Um, you need to think about your whole organization and what we call subject matter experts. 
um, is, is this something that without a, within the marketplace um, will be something that people um, satisfy not only their customers, um, but the organization, it's got to work both ways. So you've got to be able to um, work within your construct of your industry and, and but also your customers, but also thinking about maybe the customers that you don't have, but that are customers you're trying to, to get. So in this case, uh, we had a company which was a digital marketing agency um, that had turn. So similar to retail and other restaurant, many organizations, you used to be somebody, a customer, a loyal customer. You always use this hotel. You always bought these goods, went to the same grocery store. Um, but then you stopped going. And people want to understand why. Companies spend a lot of money to acquire customers. Um, they don't like to lose them. And so what we built was um, a customer attention or attrition model to understand what are the predictors of people that look like they're going to attrite or leave the brand. So being able to have a predictive model um, that can look for those people and look for markers that say, here's the factors that, that we can see of people who start to leave the brand. Interesting one is, hey, I used to go to this store every single month. Well, if I can track and see that you're not scanning your Kroger card, let's use that, and it starts to slow down. You come every week, and then you come every other week, then it's once a month. They can start to see, hey, they're going somewhere else, obviously, for their groceries, and they can figure out ways to help save you, bring you back, uh, market to you more, offer you deals. Um, in this case, there was tests that we were able to develop to really understand uh, the value of the model. Did it work? Um, were the activities to save our customer, save their customers? Were they working? So it's not only just looking at the data and building the model, but really rolling out the model and making sure the activities related to the model were working. So in this case, we were able to reduce the attrition or the amount of, and of their customers leaving um, by 20 to 30 percent. So your the ideas worked. So the, the the retention strategies worked then. Right. So the interesting thing is, you know, it, it's a it's a double-edged sword because one, you have to identify the people, then you have to identify the activities that's going to save them. Yeah. Um, I worked in an industry um, where we did models um, if you were gonna make a sale. You're on a website and you put things in your cart just haven't hit the buy button. And so the retailer can kind of see that you're not. So there's different activities. For me, if I might, if I'm offered free shipping, oh yeah, okay. So you have a pop-up. You always see those pop-ups. Hey, do you want to save 10%? Um, hey, do you want free shipping? Do you want expedited shipping? It may be just a note. Um, so we ran tests that actually said, even just having a message to almost like encourage you and note, you know, because people walk away from their computer, maybe they're looking at other websites. It isn't just offer me a deal. It's also really honing in on which group of customers need which offer to get them to transact. And it's not the same. And so I've worked with organizations where they used to, hey, we'll just give someone 25%. We'll pop up that increases conversion rate. Well, it also decreases your profit. So then you start to test, well, maybe does 20% work? Again, does free shipping work? Free shipping might be cost $13 to the organization. You know, how do you kind of tear that down and how do you change the groups? So that way you increase um, the overall profitability. You may not get the same conversion rate if you offer 25%, but it's the balance of, I can have a better conversion rate, but I, Profits are up here and that's okay. Yeah. Great, thanks. So ultimately, what's the viability of this working? We've got innovation, looks like it's gonna um, work. There's interest in the marketplace, but you really need to understand, you know, what's the longer term impact? Is it viable to your overall organization? How does it really scale? Um, and is it is it consistent that you need as part of the process? to be constantly evaluating that. The company, um, there's a company here in Columbus, Ohio, 
called Jobs Ohio, um, part of a kind of a government born agency, if you will, but um, they wanted to know how to bring more business to Ohio. So every state has an office like this that says, hey, Honda's going to build a new plant. I want them to build the plant in Ohio. How do you bring more companies, offices, obviously brings jobs, obviously brings a lift to the economy. Um, but they wanted to know who do I prioritize in terms of employers that make sense to Ohio, we have a chance of winning, and who are going to stay here. So what they talked about is having a few different models in terms of a site capture model, um, a retention model, and expansion. So we want to go and get new companies to come and do business in Ohio. Uh, we want them to stay. There's a lot of companies that get tax incentives and then they leave. Um, they get a better offer from somewhere else. Um, and then we want companies to expand. I've got a plant in a Honda plant, but I'd like to them to bring more production or bring offices or you know whatever that is. We want those companies who are here um, to expand uh, the, the folks that they're hiring and, and the revenue that they're bringing to the state of Ohio. So we were able to do some machine learning um, and test uh, different models within to see how these were working and how we, we as a state were able to go out and bring these companies um, here and to stay here. That, you know, that one is a good, um, just to back up, that one's a good one in terms of true machine learning because there's constant data being added. But the interesting thing is working with a retailer that has thousands of transactions a day and then thinking about how often a new company comes in to the state of Ohio and builds out a new office or builds out a new plant um, is much different. So you really have to think about what's your data set, how much data, how with the frequency of the data um, when you're really building these models um, and what you want to capture and what makes sense um, in terms of how far back, um, how maybe the economies have changed, thinking about um, you know, even after last year, what are companies that may have a remote presence um, that are growing that would really benefit from, from being in Ohio and how do you look at that within the data. So in terms of process and differentiators, um, you know, to commercialize this work, um, there's, again, you know, getting the insights and understanding what data, what do you, what problem may you might be able to solve or what problem do you see within the data, creating something to incubate and really test and understand, validate what those, what those ideas are, and then commercializing them um, to be able to be turning that into a viable business product. So there's really kind of these four areas, all of which use data to determine, use the data as the outcome, and really using the data to, um, again, test, learn, understand um, what is happening within the facets of you know, innovation. Again, idea, a product, anything like that. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're now in a largely virtual world and many companies, when you think of a Fortune 500 company, you think of a traditional, like we got in an office, there was a whiteboard, we all put post-it notes, let's think of ideas. It's very different with everyone behind a screen and on Zoom calls um, to be able to be thoughtful and creative. Um, you know, there's some new opportunities that you can think about um, in getting innovation and having an innovation mindset. So there's certainly a ton of collaboration tools. Um, a lot of companies are looking at kind of virtual offices. You know, how do you be able to have uh, Microsoft has a, a nice virtual whiteboard um, to be able to facilitate this. Um, but again, thinking about being proactive and going from um, having an innovation and a growth mindset and making it a priority rather than just kind of the day to day, here's my list of meetings, here's the activities that I need to do, I'm signed on, I do them and, I, and I'm done for the day. Thinking about how maybe you break out teams of innovation, there's a word called skunk works. Um, so instead of maybe having innovation all over the organization um, and distributed, maybe you have to pull it together 
into a center and have those people be somewhere different and be working outside of the confines of kind of the day to day. Give them the opportunity to innovate, think, um, test, put things on a board um, and, and really give them the time and it be separate from everyone else. Thinking about communication barriers and really taking the time to think about, are we making the time for innovation? Are we taking the time to look at the data? A lot of people look at data to answer a question. Hey, I've got a question. What, you know, what happened on Tuesday? What did we do with this? How's our profit? But are they really spending the time and looking at different ways, cutting, slicing, and dicing, and taking the time to look at that to be able to bring new ideas or new pain points to the forefront? Um, you know, do you have channels across the organization? You know, so sometimes there's a bottoms up. I, I see this happening or, hey, I have this great idea versus a top down, which really says, let's look at the whole kind of ecosystem or let's look at everything and start to think about from a business perspective, what could we be doing differently? Is there a pain point? Is there something that keeps coming up? Um, for people and really asking the questions rather than having people kind of bring them up. Where is there the value and um, within the organization and help ideate from a top down? Um, is there transparency in the pain points? A lot of people don't want to talk about the problems or things that they see. Are we really giving people the forum to bring new ideas to the day table? money saving areas, um, things that you're frustrated with. Every day I've got to like run a report, pull this information, pull this. Couldn't it be automated? And then I could spend more time doing other things. Um, I had a report that I used to run and um, I had a partner of mine that uh, almost spent five hours getting the data, putting the data in, you know, trans, you know, transforming the data, moving it around, being able to uh, take and predict. It was a forecasting tool. Um, we ended up getting it down to 30 minutes. Uh, we just kept on looking and saying, it doesn't feel like for the value of the five hours, we're getting as much as we need to, or for what we use this for, five hours is the right input of time. Um, so we were able to um, do some different things um, to be able to move the data and get the insights that we need and much faster and made it down to 30 minutes. Um, but until you, know, you really take the time to think about that, where you're spending your time or effort or your customer is, um, you may not be able to see those little pieces of information and opportunity to innovate. You know, Lee, you talked about automation too there. And this is an area that I would talk about a lot that people don't recognize is that actually doing automation work on projects is which should still be considered innovation, right? because it's then freeing you up to think differently and to do different types of work. So I just call that out for some of the students on the call here of don't think that um, when you're asked to automate something that you're not doing something innovative for the organization. Yeah, and it's really interesting because there's tools that companies um, have that are um, like task mining tools. So you can really go in and watch people, watch keystrokes, um, be able to capture the tasks. We kind of just go about our day um, and just do things and run reports or um, how we create decks or whatever we're doing, you know, within our day to day. But if we really break it down into each step, you can really start to see the process end to end. Uh, recently, recently worked with a client um, and went through their process. So we had 35 people on the phone, super knowledgeable group. Here's their day to day. But literally within each point, we said, what's the pain point? Why, what are you doing manual? What's a step that you could avoid? Why do you have, where are steps that maybe you don't have to do every single time? How do you eliminate those? We came up with 82 pain points. When you really like spent the time getting into it, I don't think that all the people on the phone probably were grumbling about their job, but until we looked at it and said, this is the way that we need to apply some business logic, automate, maybe there's an innovative way, maybe there's a tool out there. Um, maybe we need to build an API to be able to, you know, link different, um, different tools. A lot of companies go out and use a tremendous amount of off the shelf um, tools within their business, which is awesome. They don't talk to each other. Getting the data out, how do you create that linkage between them 
that alone, you know, I have to go into this, then I have to come out, then I have to go into that, then I have to come out, and I got to move it, right? All of those are steps. Can you streamline that? Again, it becomes almost the norm, but if you took some of that, those activities out, you could spend more time. I think um, I have a lot of clients who in the past would say, when I work on a data project, I'm working on a model, I'm doing analysis, 80% of the time is just going to find the data, getting the data, pulling it all together. Um, and then I spend the other 20% actually doing something with it. And we really want to flip the script on that. I think it's improving, but how do you really spend less time trying to just wrangle all the data and have, um, as I had a, a former CFO say, kind of a smart filing cabinet a good system to be able to use so you can spend more time really looking at the data, getting insights, um, innovating, um, rather than just spending the time um, doing the work. So automation absolutely is a, is a big topic uh, of conversation that really brings new ideas, um, not only to the table, but commercial ideas, but also internally um, is, a, is a facet of innovation. So as we talked about um, in terms of innovation, kind of top down and bottom up, um, you know, is there a problem that we're trying to solve or is there an opportunity? Two big areas, we've, we've talked a lot about this today in terms of, you know, how to bring innovation. Um, uh, maybe you've heard this phrase before, fail fast and fail often. Um, you might have had examples in class. There's a lot of innovation that does not become commercially viable. I think Procter & Gamble probably has a ton of uh, business cases alone. Uh, they you know, had a product, they spent a year, right? Did a lot of testing, put it out into the marketplace and it didn't work. Spend millions of dollars. So you start to say like, oh, how could we avoid that, right? Everyone likes to go back and figure out. But actually out of that, came a lot of really good ideas. So the, the one idea itself didn't work, but out of the learnings, um, and there was a specific diaper one years ago um, and, the, and the product they were using within the diaper um, yielded way more results than probably the commercial viability of that product unto itself as they were forecasting and thinking about what it was going to add. Actually, because of its failure, provided much more value. So I think as we think about innovation, it's not always like, you know, how am I, how am I, you know, hitting a home run? You know, sometimes you have to take the out and there's a there's an RBI and someone still scores. It's not you, but it adds value somewhere else. So I'm a big proponent of fail fast and fail often. I like this quote, creativity allows yourself to make mistakes. Design is knowing which ones to keep. Again, I think a lot of people focus on what's going to work rather than let's put all of the ideas on the table and then go from there. Let's be really creative. And a lot of times organizations or people are just, we're all busy. We don't have time. I don't have time to just sit there and think. You have to make the time. Um, the other thing uh, everyone always talks about, you, you get um, constrained by your own biases. So, oh, no, we've tried that before. Oh, I remember years ago that, you know, that we tried that and that didn't work. New time, new, new world. Every, every year with the way um, innovation of other companies are, you can't think that way of what hasn't worked in the past. Don't think about the kind of constraints within your organization, um, but come to the table and, and bring ideas and then from there, be able to prioritize them and go through the process. You know, is it viable? Is it desirable? Can we scale this instead of thinking all the reasons why you can't do something? Um, I was on a call yesterday. Um, I give credit, this, this came from Dave Cherry, um, but I thought there was a lot of really good points in here. Um, so there was a talk about where is kind of data strategies of 2025, but I think most of these are one of the topics today that companies are kind of wrestling with to get to a better place three, four, five years down the road. First one is, 
data still is not necessarily top of mind for executives and making it a priority within an organization. Do they do reports? Absolutely. But are they really taking data and taking the time to learn and spending time with AI, with machine learning, maybe with data science? Not really. 85% uh, of analytics projects fail to return ROI. That came from um, an outside company, but a lot of analytics projects, you know, maybe the direct result is, um, you know, an ROI may be hard to measure, but again, similar to what I just talked about, about fail fast, fail often, you may like be doing, making models, looking at data and may not necessarily, I always say it's like the ROI of air conditioning. It's really hard to measure until you don't have it. So you may not be able to put a hard, fast number to your analytics, but there could be value other places um, down the road. But, um, you know, it's hard to combat someone saying, oh, analytics projects, we didn't get any ROI from them. Um, you know, how do you, how do you measure, you know, a TV commercial? You know, a lot of it is compounding efforts provide value. Analytics has the most understandable value proposition. So it's interesting, a lot of people aren't focusing on it, hard to have ROI, but it really does have a good value proposition. And spending more time on that within organizations is going to be critical um, as, as organizations. Organizations had to innovate really um, years ahead uh, of where they were. Um, especially last year um, in a lot of industries, um, paper heavy companies couldn't be paper heavy anymore. We had to become digital. I didn't want to go to a store. Like we had to figure out how you deliver, um, how it comes to you. How do I do curbside? Lots of different industries um, had to figure out, um, you know, what's their value proposition um, very quickly. And we need to continue that acceleration of ideas. Uh, we see too much coding and not enough learning of the business. So this goes back to, we spend a lot of time data wrangling and maybe not enough time actually looking at the data. Uh, how to leverage external data. Um, there's tons of external data. You can buy, you can um, free data sets, you can scrape um, from the internet. Um, figuring out what's the right data. I think a lot of companies get overwhelmed by the sheer amount of data. Um, that they have and what's really, um, what's valuable data. I worked with a large QSR years ago and they were looking at Yelp data, customer sentiment. Should we look at everyone who posts on Twitter about us, about our competitors? And you really start to say like, what, you know, what is that going to provide to you? Um, and how are you going to use it? Um, you need trust, you need agility and resilience when uh, working with data. Uh, I talked about this earlier, um, sometimes garbage in is valuable data, so there's always the garbage in, garbage out, don't, you know, don't use bad data. Um, there might be value in it, don't, don't underestimate um, and cut out and again, have some biases against the data, try and really look at low, lowest level of data, um, and you might get some new insights. Um, probably the four biggest things, find patterns, you're not looking to make improvement, have confidence, um, which is always in data science a, a big function. And then um, what's the value? And value may not, again, be profit or sales. There might be other ways that data is providing value. Um, there's a lot of talk around getting away from the term data scientist and more about business scientist. You know, where, does, where do people understand the intersection of um, data science, but understanding the efficacy within in business overall? We're almost at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for your time. Um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, happy to answer any questions now. What can uh, I was just going to reiterate your point there at the end, Lee, about when you were going over the eight different or nine, um, and you talk eighty-five percent of analytics projects fail to return ROI. I wanted to highlight that for some of the students here to to remember of why are you doing the project? It, always make sure you get that from the, the leader or whomever is asking you to do the work. What will you do with this information once I give it to you? Sometimes the answer is I just want to know, and that's an okay answer, especially from senior like senior senior people. But uh, but if if it's just because I don't know, I was kind of curious. 
that might not be the best use of time if they're not going to use the information for anything. So I think a lot of times too, Lee, when, when they say projects fail to return ROI, it's because no one knew how they were going to use it and how they wanted to measure the project. Um, and that's never, that, I shouldn't say never, that's always an afterthought. It's almost always an afterthought. Yeah. So I think it's key that we, that you all walk away from here realizing that. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Well, I do want to thank you for your time. I, I recognize that students likely have to get on to class next. I don't know what time their schedules are. I don't keep track of all that stuff, but we do appreciate your time, Lee. We will be posting this on our YouTube channel um, with a few edits probably to shorten down to time, but we, uh, thank you so much. I thought it was really great information. Um, and hopefully we will get to see you and hear from you soon. Yes, awesome. In person. Yeah. Have a great Friday, everyone. Thanks, right. Lee. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.